Certainly, I think uh, what I noticed last week, um, it seems like months ago, uh, at some point, um, the CDC commissioner and then the president went on TV, and uh, from that day on, you know, it spurred. We basically said, oh, we're going to have to, inside the agency, start to structure a different communications response and start planning for this. And we felt pretty good about that um, at the end of the week last week, uh, Friday, you know, and, uh, and of course over the weekend we had our first announcement, of the announcement of our first presumptive case. And uh, so Monday morning, once again, we started in a different place, communication-wise, and, uh, and certainly in the last uh, 24, if not 12 hours, where uh, we're seeing nationally uh, closure uh, issues happening, whether it be sports, games, uh, schools in some states, and so forth. So it's been a rapidly evolving situation. I will say that, you know, just to frame this out, particularly the issue of school closure, um, you know, I'm not a public health person, I'm an educator, um, but I've been in a lot of those conversations. I think the framing of it from a public health perspective is we have two kinds of strategies to deal with a virus of this nature. One are containment strategies and the other are mitigation strategies. Uh, containment strategies are essentially designed to stop the spread of the virus. Mitigation strategies are designed to slow its spread. School closures, uh, based on CDC guidance, which really was the result of H1N1, fall into the mitigation category, not a containment strategy. Um, at this moment in time in Vermont, my perception is that we're, we are doing both. We are doing both containment and mitigation, but that's rapidly evolving. Um, so when I say containment, what I observe uh, is this idea of contact tracing. So as we test someone, we, we find out, the uh, Department of Health finds out uh, that they've tested someone, they, they then begin a regime of tracing back who that person had contact with. And, you know, containment invokes strategies like quarantine and so forth. You've, you've heard about all that in the media. School closure falls into that other category, category, however, of mitigation. This is where we start to assume that we're not necessarily going to stop the virus. Our, our chief objective is to slow it. And that's where uh, we start to consider the social distancing and school, school closure kind of falls into that category. So we produced guidance on Tuesday um, that essentially uh, starts to provide that common vocabulary for school districts so they understand containment and mitigation. Um, and we, our guidance largely conforms to the CDC guidance that was developed um, as a result of H1N1. So we talk about a couple different types of school closure in that guidance. So we talk about reactive school closures and preemptive school closures. So reactive school closures, which I think we did employ in H1N1, uh, are implemented when you have large numbers of students uh, sick or showing up to school and being sent home. Uh, or your staff are sick. And basically, you're, you're left with a question of can I even operate the school or should I operate the school? Um, we're not, we haven't had much of that yet in terms of reactive closure, but I would say that um, the closures we've had to date kind of fall into that category. We've had, uh, for instance, um, you know, staff that are ill, they're being quarantined, what have you, and uh, folks are reacting to disinfect their buildings and so forth. So it's sort of a type of reactive school closure. Um, but we haven't had large, you know, an outbreak yet uh, to the scale that that kind of reactive decision making has been implemented. Preemptive school closure, on the other hand, is, is done uh, before um, the outbreak uh, occurs, and uh, but that's done in the context of a severe outbreak. So, uh, as you're seeing around the world, school closures are used as sort of a last measure uh, as part of a social distancing strategy, really to uh, be employed to. Um, to disrupt the spread of the virus, to slow it down. So we've been evaluating that, and we've been alerting schools. We are evaluating school closure measures. And uh, if you saw in the last 24 hours, um, you know there are states that are employing those measures. So it's being actively considered here in Vermont as well. Um, but you know, as uh, Dr. Fauci, if you've seen him on national television, probably our preeminent uh, specialist on these things, he, he makes the very blunt argument that you know school closures are an important tool, and we've been communicating that to the Vermonters. Uh, you can make them too early. You can make the decision to close preemptive school decisions too early and have no effect whatsoever on the spread of the virus. And you can make those decisions too late. <laughs> so the timing of a preemptive school closure is critical. 
and uh, that's you know where we're at right now is sort of considering you know the timing of that. Um, we also know that uh, the you know we're, this virus is sort of an excess ex ex excuse me it's early in the morning ex exponential uh, variable. Its spread is not going to increase on a geometric scale, but on an exponential one, meaning that just because we have two cases today doesn't mean we won't have ten tomorrow, then a thousand, you know, or whatever. So. We have to be prepared to, uh, you know, act in, a, in that kind of dynamic situation. So we're we're very attentive to that, and we're working very closely uh, with Department of Health. So I think, you know, I, I just sort of conclude with my comments to say um, I think from a science standpoint, uh, we're working very closely with the scientists in our state, and I've, I've grown and always had a lot of confidence in them. But I continue to be impressed with our Department of Health and and um, folks we have clinicians at the local level uh, all those those uh, communication channels are open and working very well um, but you know a lot of these decisions um, happen beyond the realm of science so we have we, the science is only telling us so much and there's a lot of unknowns about this virus. so we also have to be prepared as leaders to act uh, based on the larger concerns of public health and so forth and we're prepared to do that um, but I feel like we're well informed by the science to the extent it, it can inform these types of decisions. I will also uh, just go beyond um, the issue of school closure, just talk about um, we are also considering uh, sort of related issues to that. I think school closure is probably the most significant um, social mitigation strategy we have available, but we have other issues we have to attend to as a result of that. Um, primarily because K-12 school closure is much more disruptive. Um, you know, in Vermont schools are community schools, and our schools are tightly integrated into the community. So, you know, some people have been asking, well, the colleges are closing, how, not, how come not K-12? You know, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, largely, K-12 schools are more, closing K-12 schools is much more disruptive than college. We also know from this virus, from the science, that this virus does not seem to affect uh, younger students. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, the elderly are more at risk, um, and certainly students could be spreading the virus to elderly, so we have to be cognizant of that. But it appears from the, the health data that students are not nearly as risk. K-12 students are not nearly as risk. But K closing K-12 schools is a very disruptive action, and most states don't contemplate that until it's sort of towards the end of your social mitigation strategies. Uh, but you know, along the lines of being disruptive, we are looking at you know the issues of social gatherings and so forth. You know, we have sports programs, field trips, you name it. Schools are once again very involved with community activities. Uh, so those we're actually put out new guidance on that today. Uh, we're pursuing the financial implications of closing schools, which are significant as well. Uh, we've put in a waiver with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on congregate meal feeding of students, so we'll be prepared. Uh, to um, even if schools are closed, we'll be able to produce meals for students, uh, free and reduced meals. Uh, most states are requesting those waivers now, and we have a conference call this morning with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, they're pretty well. I mean, just, they're granting these waivers pretty much on a large scale at this point. So that's that's I think well taken care of. We'll, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll, so let me just keep going now because I'll lose my track. I already lost. <laughs> no, so. Uh, um, we have implications on federal monies, you know, so we're pursuing conversations with our partners. You know, this is done on, with partnership with other states. Issues of like Title I money and so forth, how do we, how do we dispense those funds, you know, uh, to what extent um, our federal testing requirements going to be waived. So we're, we're in contact with all those sort of logistical issues uh, with other states. You know, we're not alone in this. So all those issues are being considered. Um, and are being discussed in, in detail. So um, I expect in the coming days you'll see more closures of events, you know, more cancellation of events, and we'll be discussing school closure more directly um, as, as the situation evolves. Um, I would say, you know, the way we operate in Vermont, um, we, we're fortunate to have a very flat sort of organizational structure to a certain extent. So I have daily conversations with superintendents, if not hourly. So the, that, that's been the primary chain of command we've relied upon is the superintendents as sort of under the law, they're charged with administering their school districts. And I have hourly, if not, you know, more frequent conversation with superintendents as their issues emerge. Um, 
but also in communication with the, you know Jeff Francis on a regular basis as well. So we're we're understanding what their communications needs are and their guidance needs are, and trying to respond to that as quickly as possible. Um, I would say, as you've noticed, uh, the impact on the agency. Uh, we we started to plan as we saw, you know, what the challenge would be uh, with us. We started to plan on sort of structural changes inside the agency. You've noticed you haven't seen Ted Fisher around. Um, yeah. We know he so, success. He does. He, he wanted me to express his uh, sentiment. That sentiment to you. Um, so we had to plan on, you know, uh, changing, you know, and augmenting essentially our communications team. So we've uh, Ted. Uh, Ted is in a role now. He's our chief liaison to the State Emergency Operations Center. Um, he's there right now, actually. And we pulled people from other agency sections to augment our communications team. So we've we've created internally a, a sort of an ad hoc structure to respond to this. Um, and we've employed some new tools to do that, uh, lists and so forth, using video conferencing. And so we've we've had to modify our structure to uh, to um, you know support the field. Uh, you'll see Emily Simmons probably more uh, directly um, like pushing a lot of the policy work over to her, which she was always very involved anyway. But you, you'll probably see more of her in Ted's former role, uh, as Ted is is brought directly into managing communications on this. And that can change, but for now, that's that's how we're going. Why don't I stop there? I'd be happy to address any other questions you might have. Okay. Um, getting back to, it's encouraging to hear that the conversation can happen with, happen with the U.S. Department of Agriculture about, I think you said congregant. Congregant, you know, so we have requirements under the regulations that we can't provide free and reduced lunch unless the kids are all eating together. So we're going to waiver from that requirement. Okay, so, so you, it's a waiver so they don't have to all be together. Correct. And so I guess I'm just um, curious what thought has gone into the transportation and distribution of those meals and whether that's something where school districts would have the ability or authority to you know, utilize existing busing contracts. I'm not right. sure. I'm not trying to provide yeah. an answer. We're just curious about that. Right. So at this phase, we need to have the uh, um, appropriate regulatory authority to enact that. And then the de that's all details, right? <laughs> so yeah. important details. But first, where we are now is just getting the appropriate regulatory uh, authority or the waiver from the, the uh, regulation so that we can act it as we need it. But obviously, at the local level, that would be implemented. You need to go to the speaker's office. Um, okay. Yeah. Put something, yeah. Yeah, so those are, those are all, you know, at this point, we, questions like that we accumulate, and yeah. uh, those are topics for former future guidance. But at this point, um, we started a conversation last week about requesting the U.S. waiver. So we're, you know, we're a week ahead of sort of requesting these things, but now these things catch up with us, and, and yeah. we're not ready to implement it. I will, will say another waiver I'm requesting of the state board, similar kind of idea. Um, I'm asking the state board uh, at its meeting next week to give me authority to grant waivers from the school calendar requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, you know, I think they'll be amenable to that. We'll see how that goes. But uh, it doesn't give me the, uh, the uh, I'm not asking for the authority to waive the requirement. I'm asking the authority to hear the appeal or the waiver. So they don't, so districts would not have to file that appeal with the state board of education. They could do it directly with me and I could expedite that consideration. Uh, so, you know, I think he probably asked you this question already, you know, is, is, are there state law statutes that we need to be acting on to free you up to do what you need to do? I don't think, I don't think so. I think, you know, we have available mechanisms, mechanisms inside the administration to work with you on that. So uh, there's nothing specific to education at this point. Um, you know, the, the, some of it's in regulation, like the calendar waiver. So we'll be working with the state board on those kinds of issues. That was one that uh, emerged last last week immediately. So coincidentally, they're having a meeting next week. So we asked them to put to consider that on their agenda. Agenda, excuse me. And I think they're amenable to uh, considering that. Uh, we're just, you know, it's, it's in the theme of the USDA waiver request. We're just trying to make sure there's no obstacles in our path, forward path. It's not about what we're doing now. It's about that forward path and making sure that we will have the flexibility to act if we need to act, and maybe we won't. Yeah. Kennedy, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood um, how you characterize this. So obviously the big nut is getting the waiver from the USDA. And then um, you, then the AOE would probably 
issue guidance and then solutions would be figured out and implemented on the local level for kids to come pick up meals or deliver however however a district can do that right. best okay thanks. yeah and we've, we've provided specific guidance i could bring it up on the screen uh, we've provided guidance already you know i think we so, saw that yesterday yeah, or, um, um, yeah was, so we was, have you know we have just sort of the, just gives you it's a great example of sort of how the iterative approach is happening mm -hmm. so we're pursuing on a macro level any kind of large uh, federal waiver or uh, identifying legal opportunities for us that we're going to need flexibility and we're ensuring we have that at the same time we're keeping a field prize that we're doing that and we're also preparing them and that's the a lot of our guidance now is preparing them with the vocabulary or uh, the structural opportunities by which they'll have the flexibility and and where they don't have the flexibility and so everyone's sort of clear and uh, some of that is we, we just pushed out some guidance uh, within the hour to the special ed administrators, for example. Uh, similar kind of path, you know, the federal government's providing new guidance on uh, educating special ed students uh, during the virus. You know, we're interpreting that. Everything's being CC'd to the superintendent, so they're getting the macro sort of sense of all the different silos of educational programs and requirements. Um, but we're uh, we're bringing that out to the field as quickly as possible, but we're also trying to translate it and say, look, here's, here's where you'll have flexibility, here's where you don't, here, here are the concerns. Uh, just put on your radar to get you warmed up to the idea that these, these types of decisions are coming um, and uh, you know, keep them as warm as much as possible. What are the implications of the governor declared a state of emergency? Does that give you a lot more authority to just grant waivers? You know, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with that issue. Um, the governor is holding a press conference today at 5.30. That was announced recently. Um, so he's going to be talking more uh, directly about the mitigation. I talked about this mitigation concept or social distancing. He'll be talking about those issues at his press conference. Sure, yeah. yeah. So um, just this morning, like as a teacher, a former teacher, I was just going over in my head what I'd be doing right now for right. you know, my students. and. Um, so one of the things I know about kids is they're anxious right. now yeah. because their parents are anxious right. and their teachers are anxious. So, right. And one of the best things I know that we can do for kids after a disaster is get them back into school because what they need is that structure. That's right. So the online instruction, you know, I'm assuming this is a really good opportunity for all educators and institutions to be thinking about right. because I'm sure you can't just get online right now. I mean, I don't know if people are prepared yeah. for such and so I think this is a really good opportunity you know, to think about that, like who doesn't have internet, right. you know, yep. find that out, and then what kind of instruction could we provide that would provide structure for children at home? Yeah. You know, because that would lower their anxiety. It's sure. just to get back into, like, I have yeah. to be at my computer. No, you're absolutely right. The structure is critical for students, um, and they rely on that structure. Yeah. You know, the. Uh, the issue of online learning is one, you know, we don't have a statewide approach to that necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very uneven around the state, access to bandwidth and equipment, even uh, even in places you would think, you know, Chittenden County, there are, there are pockets where students don't have access to the internet readily, or at home don't have a device. So um, we've had, you know, you'll see in the K-12, or in the higher ed community, I mean, they can move to, to online learning pretty quickly because they have that infrastructure. Um, virtually, I, I don't know of any higher ed institution that doesn't have a learning management system and mm -hmm. doesn't have some ability. Uh, so there, it's not so hard for them, though, you know, they're not all professors are equally skilled at doing that, so they have to make that transition. But K-12 is not the same. You know, in K-12, uh, particularly at the elementary level, uh, we don't typically use online learning. You know, so it's one thing to talk about courses. You know, courses are, that whole framework's a high school concept, you know. At the elementary level, uh, we don't structure learning necessarily around courses, particularly the lower around elementary level. But would it be good to start, like, sure. you know, because yeah. I, I think this, the coronavirus, is serious. Sure. But it could be a lot more serious. You know, it could right. be in one day right. where you can't leave your house. Right. Um, and just, that would be just so good for children. Sure. You know, just to be yeah. able to have that uh, connection. Yeah, no, it's, it's, schools. the technology has been, uh, you know, both uh, a pro and a con with this kind of event, you yeah. know, in terms of, but it's a really, it's a great opportunity to try to pursue these issues. Yeah. Um, but it's important for Vermonters to realize that right now in the state, the, the ability to do that is very uneven. Right. And it, it really is, 
uh, more appropriate educationally at the high school level than it is at the elementary level, and just from an educational standpoint. Mm -hmm. So even in districts that are well resourced and have leveraged those tools, they rarely apply them in my experience at the lower elementary level. You're not going to see learning management systems employed mm -hmm. in the kindergarten, you know, because hmm. it's just not consistent with best practice of how you teach kids. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll explore those things as the rest of the country will as well. Yeah. yeah. Do you, um, do you have a role, or does the agency have a role with higher education? We have a limited interaction with them regular, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, we stay in close contact with them, you know, obviously from a, in the public, because we're tight, all brought in together on a communication structure with this incident that we're able to uh, understand their patterns of closure and their decision making and so forth. But we don't have direct regulatory oversight of that. They make those decisions to go online without right. asking us or right. so forth. I will say, um, what's in the theme of eliminating sort of structural barriers, um, I was at the standards board meeting yesterday, professional educators, so they're the group that controls licenses for teachers, and they have uh, passed yesterday a waiver to teach online, so we have a licensing regulation that would require you to have a license to teach online courses. Oh, yeah, so they, they yesterday passed a waiver to that, so um, that was helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any opportunity for schools to um, do any kind of testing or screening kind of at this point where maybe we think that the levels are low? I know that with younger or further with younger students, they may not be very symptomatic. You mean at, testing for the virus itself? Testing for the virus or any kind of like surveillance sort of testing within the school communities or people within our school communities who would be more vulnerable. I'm thinking of you know, older members of faculty or staff. I just, uh, it does seem that the lack of testing information is, is, has got to be um, affecting the decision making process in some way. And I just wonder if there's um, room for any more proactive approach to that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, I mean, the issue uh, testing is a result of lack of manpower. So <laughs> access to the materials to do it. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it would be even appropriate for school staff to do that kind of testing. You know, it has to be done in a lab. You're talking about extracting DNA from a sample and uh, even taking the samples, I suppose you'd be asking. Um, I think from the... Or even temperature monitoring. Well, yeah, we, we, we already do temperature monitoring. We do those kinds of things, absolutely. And school nurses are a vital part of our chain of command <coughs> relative to the Department of Health, so they report their data in directly. Uh, so we have, um, you know, we have an understanding of absentee rates and symptomology and so forth from our school nurses. Um, but I don't, I don't think in terms of actually identifying the virus, if that's what you're asking, that's... Um, no, I guess it's, it's interesting to hear that there is some things like temperature monitoring going on. Is that just like standard practice? That's something standard particularly practice. happening yeah, school, now? School nurses um, work closely with their local health officer and their local department, regional department of health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's consistent with their role, uh, regardless of this specific incident. So if there was a public health issue, they would be reporting that information. And they also talk with clinicians, you know, local family doctors and so forth quite frequently. If there was access to tests, would we be testing more? I don't understand your question. Uh, I guess you said there wasn't an issue of manpower, um, but it's really access to the materials for testing. And I'm asking if that access to materials was not a barrier, would we be testing one? Yeah, that's really beyond my, you know, I'm, I'm providing some commentary on public health issues be, because I've been immersed in that, but it's really not my area of expertise. That would be something to ask the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. My observation is that, you know, just nationally, uh, people are asking for greater flexibility. I mean, we've seen that sort of unfold, I think, that where we started, where the CDC was the only entity that could test uh, then we moved to uh, states being able to do presumptive testing, essentially, that then needed to be subsequently confirmed by the CDC. And now we're getting more dynamic on that ability. I was reading this morning that New York State now has some discretionary, discretionary ability to basically do more rapid testing. Um, so that's, I mean, that's evolving, but it's not an area that we're directly involved in per se. I assume you'll be watching closely what the other states that have shut down all their school systems, how they're handling it, how they're handling all these waivers that you need from the federal government. Right. And yeah, we're in close especially, to, especially the whole feeding of children. Yeah, we're in the, my organization, the CCSSO, uh, the Council of Chief State School Officers, you know, we convene regular meetings and they're, they're pulling things together like that. And we're working closely with our 
uh, various um, you know legislative staff on the Hill and so forth to do do whatever we need to do. Um, we're also, as you mentioned, sharing information among between the states. Um, and we're, you know, it's a rapidly evolving, you know, back to this ex exponential idea that this virus expands exponentially, so we have to be prepared to move very quickly. Um, and uh, we, you know, at one point, I think Vermonters felt like this, like a lot of people on the East Coast, right? That was like, it's in Asia, maybe it's in Italy, it's in California and Washington State. It's in Boston, some way, you know, and so we've, we've got to be prepared uh, to address that exponential increase. But I think that's, you know, important in the last, um, you know, Monday when I uh, was starting to talk about this, I thought it was important that we start to talk with Vermonters about containment versus mitigation, you know, and just get more accepting of this idea that our goal now isn't necessarily to stop it, it's to slow it down. And now we're asking, you know, it's funny, I don't say funny, but in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, people are uh, much more comfortable with mitigation and they're saying, you know, we need to be more aggressive on slowing it down. So it's just interesting to see mm -hmm. how um, I think everyone's become more informed and prepared. Um, as I would expect, you know, I, I work statewide. I know Vermonters will respond well to this, um, but we're, we have to be prepared to take steps to slow this. Um, it's very serious. The, um, I would say the other thing we're focusing in on is we know the seniors, um, the older population is more affected by this than the younger population. So we, I think, need to focus our energies on ensuring our most vulnerable population this, in this area with this virus is clearly the elderly. Um, so we're going to be looking very closely at how the K-12 system and you know relates. And if you think about once again our schools, our community schools, a lot of interaction with older adults in our school system perhaps more so than other states. The children always bring the colds and what have you to bring them. Yeah, house. so we, we talk about not holding a concert. Right. You know, think about how many people in that room Absolutely. are over 60, yeah. right? Yeah. Think about if we close school, how many of those students are getting their care provided by a senior citizen. So once again, we know students aren't necessarily adversely affected by the virus, but they could be the transmitters of that virus to seniors. So we have to be thinking about those issues. Any other questions? I have a comment. Sure. Um, I just wanted to convey my gratitude because, you know, at the joint hearing uh, the other day for um, the Human Services Committee, and then um, through your testimony and through watching the AOE website and seeing the guidance you guys are putting out and seeing the information that's available on the Department of Health, it, you guys are doing an amazing job. Yeah, it's, it's, and I just feel like you're really stepping up to the plate, and I feel so much steady leadership from the AOE and the Department of Health, and I think it's fantastic, and I hope you're hearing that. Yeah, thank you. No, we, we are. <laughs> and people are. You know, we, we've, um, I think we've all got to the place where we can talk frankly about the science of it, and you know, it's, yeah. uh, certainly people are fearful. We all, we're all fearful, but there is science, and there's decision-making that needs to be made, right? Um, and we're in that space now where I think everyone's comforted by having factual information and mm -hmm. knowing what the criteria are upon which decisions will be made, you know. And um, we, we can count on folks. Uh, we're fortunate as a state, once again, we have uh, superintendents who can talk with the secretary directly. Uh, parents yeah. can talk to me directly, and they're not shy about doing that. And uh, all that granular information is really helpful to factor into good decision making and good guidance coming down from the state level. So there's very little that we put out that's not responsive to what the field needs. Yeah. And we're, we don't necessarily wait for CDC to tell us what to do. We certainly work from their framework because it's so critical from a scientific standpoint, but we try to make sure that guidance is responsive to the needs of our districts, and that's our responsibility, I think. Yeah, and it trickles down in such a useful way. I mean, I, I know to have those links to share on my page and my sure. community forums, you can just see people's anxiety level you know, drop yeah. when they see the detailed information and you know that's available and the plans that are being rolled out and all the strategies that are being considered. So it's been extremely useful to me. You know, down here. Good. It is I mean, <laughs> down here on the ground. And part of it's you know when I st we last week once again it seems like months ago you know talking with superintendents about preparing for dynamic decision making. You know, yeah. like this isn't. You know, initially it was like, well, that isn't what you said yesterday. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, the CDC has changed its mind, largely because people were dissatisfied with the prior guidance, you know, particularly on the 14-day quarantine issue. It was sort of at first, if you remember, it was like, well, you, if you came back from Italy, you might want to do it, you know. 
and people are like, well, what you know, what do we do with that? So, um, you know, that that pushback, if you will, that sort of inadequate, that feedback of inadequate feedback, uh, we we transfer that up to the federal government, which then responds more, it responded in that case more emphatically with guidance. You know, so it's really important, but it is a dynamic situation. So it's. It's not necessarily useful to say, well, you've changed your mind. I'm like, yes, we have new information. People are more accepting now. Yeah, right. right. It's right. A, we're in a totally different yeah. situation right now. So they're they're asking for more aggressive evolution yes. of information. Yes, yeah. so it's uh, it's hard to keep pace with. But um, I think it's fair to say we are in a critical phase of this incident, and um, people should be prepared uh, to take steps, uh, aggressive steps, to mitigate the spread of the virus. And as a state, we're gearing up for those decisions as well. Right. Well, we'll let you get back to. Thank you for making the Thank you.